We're just going to take a look at, uh, we're going to take a page out of Jesus' book. Because one of the things is when you're not bringing a canned message or you're going to bring a tough message, and I'm not, uh, the idea is not to be tough, but sometimes when you preach the Word of God, you know, especially if you're not in the rule, if you're the exception, sometimes people get offended. You know, Pastor Cobb and I were talking about it uh, yesterday, how I was preparing for this message, and how sometimes when you bring a message that's, you know, absolute truth, people get offended. But the idea is not to offend because I have something against you or I. The idea is to preach the truth, and if it offends you, then it's good because then that means that you're looking for that truth. You know, most people, two things happen. You either get offended in life and you end up walking away or hating that thing, or you get a little bit rattled, but you realize the, the error in your ways, and then you come closer to God. You know, that's the idea when you have Christ in your life. So let's go there to John 4. Let's not get uh, too ahead of ourselves, but we're looking there. We're not going to read the whole chapter. We're just going to start there, and we're looking at, uh, let's start there in verse 6. And the title of the message today is just God's desire, God's desires for mothers. You know, what's God's desire for you as a mother, and for you who's going to be a mother, or for grandmothers, or, uh, you know, anybody who's raising children, is, uh, let's look there in John 4, and let's start reading. It says, now Jacob's well was there, and this is Jesus just come into uh, the town, and this is a famous story, so we don't have to go too deep into it. We all know the, uh, the story of the woman at the well. But it says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jake, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who, is, who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And let's stop there real quick, and we're going to go through this quickly, but this is to set up the points that I'm going to make today. And the very first thing we see here is, you know, I'm taking a page out of Jesus' book, because Jesus is really tough on the woman at the well. And we're going to see this here uh, in a little bit. But the first thing that we realize is that Jesus, what's the very first thing on his mind? And if you read all of John 4, this is a soul winning message. Uh, you know, this is where God, where Jesus himself talks about the laborers being few and the harvest is ready and that we need to go out and, and, and lead souls. And the first thing he tells the woman at the well is, look, you're looking at the separation. You know, today, you know, there's not been a, a more split country than probably today in 2019. You know, I remember growing up and trying to learn about politics, and you know, people would either become Republicans or Democrats or Independent, but the one thing that, that was true was that people would be willing to listen to each other. Now today, everything's so uh, split. I mean, you're either all for one party or all for the other party, or you believe one thing or you believe the other. So if that's the truth, then how do we separate ourselves from even that? What we do is we look at this because the, the, you see here, she says, look, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew and I'm a Sumerian woman. You're not supposed to be talking to me. And what did Jesus say? He said, look, if thou knewest the gift of God, what is the gift of God? Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How do we get that gift? It's through Jesus Christ the Lord. He's saying, look, I am the one that provides this gift. He didn't get into a battle or a, uh, or a speech. You know, and today, uh, today, it happens to me and my mom, you know, being Mother's Day, sometimes we'll be talking and I'll touch on a topic and guess what? It rattles her the wrong way or vice versa, right? And what do we end up doing? We end up having a discussion and or argument sometimes about things that probably don't have anything to do with, with anything. When the reality is we should be so focused on souls that we don't have time to argue about whether she's right or I'm wrong. You know, today, Mothers, there's an attack on a biblical mother. There's an attack on the biblical family, on God's family, right? You know, you're not a, the proper family or you're not the proper mom if you don't do the things that the world does. You know, if a mom stays at home and takes care of her children, well then, you know, she just has an oppressive husband. You know, I mean, what a mean husband that didn't let her pursue her career and go out there and be independent and live her choices. When most women that live godly and want to raise their children are doing it because they want to obey God. It's not even about the man that they're married to. It's about obeying God over everything. We see here that it starts with the gift of God, though. You know, you can't have the right attitude towards God if you don't have the right salvation. 
You know, and it's a gift of God. Let's keep reading right there. And we see that he says uh, in verse uh, 10, let's just start there again in verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Then the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And this is the point I want to make here that he tells her about eternal life. You know, we go every week for two hours, yeah, at least on Sunday, and if, if there's an opportunity during the week, we'll go so many, we'll go door knocking. And the one thing that we do is we're not going to sit there, and we're not going to argue with anybody about what they, they think the Bible says or what they think we, we, uh, we're preaching is right or wrong. All I'm there to tell people is, look, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you'd be going to heaven? And, you know, do you have the right salvation? Do you believe in Christ? And here we see that Jesus didn't get into an argument about whether he was a Jew or a, Samar or a Samaritan woman or whether she had the right. He just preached the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. And then when she finally uh, comes to and realizes that he has something that she's uh, been looking for, then he calls her out and says, look, go call your husband. We know the story. I'm not going to read all the, the, those parts. We'll go down to verse 23 while you're there. But what does he say? Look, he says, the guy you're with right now, he's not even your husband. And you've had five, five husbands before. And most people don't like going to church and listening to a tough message because they don't like listening to the truth, right? But the fact of the matter is, when God's preaching the truth, he's going to tell you about the salvation message. And I'm all for uh, churches that preach the salvation message over and over again. But I'm also for churches that also preach on sin and that preach on the absolute truths that the Bible's talking about. You know, there is a right way to be a mother. Now, are we all, are, you, are, are any mothers in here perfect? Absolutely not. So first of all, let me make that clear. I'm going to preach God's truth. You might not fall into this box, but that doesn't mean that you don't have God's grace and that you can't start living a better life for Christ today. And it's not just for the mothers. It's for all of us in this room today. You know, we can improve on our lives today, but the, we can't do it without Jesus Christ. You know, it's not necessary. Works are not necessary for salvation. But you know what? It is really nice to have uh, good works after salvation because God gives you a lot of blessings. You know, there's not a better blessing in my life than to have my wife take care of our children. Our children are such a blessing to us, but it's also a blessing to have my wife stay at home and raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. You know, my mom never worked after we were born. And thank God that she was there to make us avoid some of the issues and challenges that we ran into in life. Because, you know, I mean, as a guy, sometimes you tend to get in a little bit more trouble than, than the girls do. You know, my sister just didn't get in as much trouble as my brother and I did. I don't know why. It didn't make any sense. But, you know, she seems to be a lot more ordinary than we are. But we got in a lot more trouble. Anyways, that's a... Now I'm just telling on my parents, right? They picked on us. But go to verse 23. And it says there, so he calls her out. And she perceives that he has a power that she's never run into before. And this is the moment where she realizes who she's dealing with. You know, and that's the thing that's most important. Look, if we're going to have, you know, what's God's desire for mothers? Well, first, the first thing that you've got to do before we even cover any points is God's desire for mothers is that they be saved, that they have that eternal security in Jesus Christ, because how else are they going to give their children that confidence when they come to those questions? Because eventually all your children are going to ask, about God and about death and about life. And you know, I mean, I know all children go through the why stage where they're gonna ask why for everything and you don't have all the answers, but they're still asking why even after you don't have the answers. But it's good to have some foundational answers. This is the answer, what's the answer to life? What's the meaning of life? To have the Lord Jesus Christ, to have eternal life. Go to verse 23, it says, but the hour cometh and is now when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. And the point there is that 
if we're going to talk about anything in church, whether we're going to be speaking to mothers or fathers or families or just in general, we have to do it in spirit and in truth. And I'm not talking about the world's truths. You know, if you ask a Democrat what they believe, you know, when they believe life begins, because we're talking about mothers and them having children, they're going to give you a whole bunch of answers and what they believe their truth is. If you ask a Republican when they think life begins, and I just covered it, I'm not going to go into it, they're going to give you all their answers as to when their life begins. But what I want to talk about is when life begins according to God's word. You know, if he says that, that life is at inception, then life's at inception. You know, and there should be nothing more precious to a mother than the life of her child, right? And we've got to talk in spirit and in truth. There should be nothing more precious than to raise their children correctly and to honor their husbands and to honor those in the congregation and to raise the younger children to do the same thing. But we can't do that if we're not talking in spirit and in truth. Let's go to verse 26. It says uh, there, oh no, verse 24, I'm sorry. God is a spirit and then they worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am him. And then we see here in verse 29, she says, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And the point I'm trying to make is, look, Jesus gave her the gospel message. He's talking about himself, but he's also telling her there's everlasting life. Then he calls her out for her sin. He is... He is preaching hard to her. And what, what's the result of it? When you're speaking in spirit and in truth with compassion for people. See, there's a difference between getting up here and pointing fingers. It's real easy to point fingers. Finding faults in people is about as easy as it comes. I mean, anybody can find a fault in anybody. That, that's so easy that, you know, I'm not even going to do it because, I mean, that's just like shooting, you know, fish in a bucket or in a barrel. But the thing that is difficult is showing people the error of their ways in compassion. Right? And what happened here is the Samaritan woman, or the woman at the well, she believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then she becomes a soul winner herself. What's the first thing she does? See, today in society, today feminist women, women that believe motherhood is redefined, they would get mad that he called her out for being in sin, right? And today she would have then left and, and said, you know, this guy came, and I felt like he, he attacked my my womanhood and my rights and my beliefs. Instead, what did she say? She says, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. It's not this, the Christ. And let's see what happens here. Uh, go down to verse 39. It says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testify, he told me all that ever I did. So many believed because she went and became a witness to Christ. See, even though God reminded her of her sin, it was after the salvation message. See, we have to preach on sin, but the first thing we have to focus on is, where is your eternal destination? You know, mothers have a responsibility to their children. You know, I, if my wife, and, and I know my wife's brilliant, by the way, so I, I made sure I, I ran this by her. By the way, as I was preparing this message, I mean, talk about having a good wife. She, like, tore all my points apart until I got them right, you know? So hopefully, you know, this message comes out well. But the one thing that I was telling her is I said, look, I don't care if our children learn, you know, their geniuses or not. But if you lay the foundation of Jesus Christ, if they are eternally saved, then that's all that really matters. The rest, you know, they'll have to figure it out. Even if I don't give them all the tools, guess what? As adults, you start to figure out, every adult always fi uh, has figured out that at some point, your parents didn't give you all the tools you needed. Even as great as my parents were, as good as they uh, raised us up and they provided education and advice and, you know, they were there for us, there's just stuff that they just drop the ball on. And I'm not going to pretend like I'm going to drop, not drop the ball with our kids. I mean, I'm a human. You know, I live in the flesh. But if I can preach to them in spirit and in truth, then I'm going to make sure that they have that eternal salvation, right? We see here that they believed on her word. Let's go to verse 40. It says, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. You know, many were saved because of her testimony, and then he stuck around and many more were saved. Today, you know, most people wouldn't get saved because she would be so offended that he called her out for living in sin and fornication that she wouldn't, that she wouldn't even listen to what he had to say. See, the problem today is we're too quick to point out what the other side is doing wrong. 
when we should be focused on the salvation message. And then we talk about the issues that are, that are going on. See, because what I want to talk about, and, you know, I don't even engage people in stupidity anymore. You know, sorry to use such a strong word, but unless we're talking about foundational truths, I don't want to talk about it. Because for me, I don't care if somebody says that they passed a bill that you shouldn't murder a baby when you hear the heartbeat, because life's at inception. You know, you don't hear a heartbeat till about the eighth day. So what you're telling me is that you're okay with murdering a baby in the first seven days. That's not an absolute truth to me. That's not okay in my book, because it's not okay in God's book. So, moving on, I'm going to just uh, close out with this. I'm going to give you three, God, uh, three godly women. We're going to use three godly women, and I'm going to leave you with three points, or three desires that God has for godly mothers. And I'm talking about absolute truth, godly mothers. And, it, you know, obviously, you, you, know, you might be listening to what I say, and you'd be like, well, Pastor, what if, you know, what if my husband left me? And I just didn't have the opportunity to stay married, you know, because God wants us to be married for all, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't condone divorce, you know, what if, what if my husband left me? Well, you know, we're all sinners, you can't control everything, but you can start from that point to live a better life for Christ, right? You can start to do the things that are right. Or, you know, what if, uh, you know, in the past I, I did stupid things and maybe I took, partook in some of these sins? Well, that was the past. What does the Bible say? Putting all things behind me, reaching forward. Right? Pressing towards the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. So the thing is, if the point here is I'm just giving you the absolute truth. Right? This is the point in our lives where we can make a reset change. And the reason that I thought it was a good reset message is, you know, the, my dad, at least in a, in a biblical home, and I, I'm not, my parents aren't, we, didn't, we weren't raised in a Bible-believing church. You know, I was raised in a Seventh-day Adventist church, which is, which is a false religion. But we had a traditional home. My dad worked. My mom stayed at home. You know, my dad was the enforcer. He was a disciplinary. You know, if my mom said, you know, if she couldn't handle it anymore, she'd be like, just wait till I tell your dad when he comes home. And then we knew that, you know, all bets were off. And I mean, my dad was so strict that he'd wake us up. You ever went to bed early trying to make sure you avoided your dad so you didn't get spanked? You know, my, my dad would wake us up, spank us, and then put us back to sleep. You know, that's how disciplinary it was, right? But the one thing that, that was great about my mom was she was the reset in our lives. You know, there's nothing like going to your mother with an issue, with a challenge, or with a, a concern, and she just gave you that motherly advice. And it was almost like a reset. You know, you talked to your mom, you felt good about it, you knew, like, now I have a reset button. I can, you know, clean the slate and go forward towards it. Moms are always mu much more understanding, much more compassionate. You know, there's times when I want to get onto my children, my wife's like, this is not the, the moment to do so. Not that she withholds discipline, but there's times to, to do it correctly. You know, and there's times where I just, you know, as an enforcer, I'm just like, hey, let's just get the job done. I've got other things to do, and let's move on. And she's like, well, there's got to be a little bit of compassion behind it, right? And not that I don't love my children, just that's the mother's love. That's the thing that mothers do best. You know, they have that compassion. They have that nurturing spirit that us as men, even though we can learn it, we're not, we're, it's not innate in us. So let's look at the things that, that uh, we want to. But before we do that, and uh, turn your Bibles over to 1 Samuel. Uh, and we're going to be there just in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Turn over to 1 Samuel. But the world wants you to redefine what motherhood is. The world wants to re redefine what mothers should do. And, you know, they, they, they use terms like feminist. They, they uh, applaud single mothers. They applaud working mothers. And look, if a mother needs to work because of the situation and there's an exception, the exception makes the rule. But that should not be the rule. There are exceptions in life, but that shouldn't be the rule. You know, the rule should be that mothers should be there for their children. I'm going to give you biblical background for this. You know, they, uh, they applaud women that, that have control over their bodies and murder uh, babies, and then they choose which babies they want to keep and which babies they don't. And then even in the Christianity, you know, you have these watered-down uh, Christian mothers that maybe they're not going to do those things, but they also turn a blind eye or, or they're willing to accept what the world defines as motherhood. You know, two women that stood out this week. I don't know if you've ever heard of an actress by the name of Elisa, Elisa Milano, but she sent out a tweet saying that basically they should withhold or be celibate to the men in their lives and to women have the choice to, to control their bodies. Look, the Bible says that you have free will, but that body inside your body is not your body. It's another human being. You know, they're making it, it's, it's an uproar and she's angry because... Uh, she wants to have the right, basically, to be a murderer. 
You know, the Bible says that a murderer, you know, how do you handle a murderer? You put them to murder, right? But here in the United States, I mean, we murder thousands of babies every day. We end up in the millions, all, you know, for the sake of uh, filthy lucre's sake, for money. Then there's another article, and, uh, you know, I don't know if you've, you've heard. And the reason I'm picking these is because Hollywood seems to kind of define what people should think about things. You know, they do it through the media, they do it through the news, they do it through the movies. And there's an actress uh, by the name of Charlize Theron. I don't know if anybody knows who she is, but she adopted two children. You know, and, and uh, just 22 days ago, it says, Charlize Theron reveals seven-year-old daughter is transgender. In an interview with the Daily Mail, actress Charlize Theron revealed her adopted daughter is transgender. Yes, I thought she was a boy too, Theron said while talking about her seven-year-old Jackson, until she looked at me when she said she was three-year-old, said, I'm not a boy. And so she refers to this boy as a she. Look, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. There's nothing confusing about being a boy, and there's nothing confusing about being a girl. And then we should not, that's, for me, that's child abuse. and should not be tolerated. That's not my definition of motherhood. And so we're going to look at the Bible, and we're going to tell you the three things. So you're there in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, you're going to be there in chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verse uh, 26. And the first thing I want to point out is Hannah was a great mother, in my opinion. Biblically, Hannah did some great things in, uh, according to the Bible. You just see her in 1 first, uh, first Samuel chapter 1 and 2. She birthed Samuel. And Samuel was a great prophet of God. He's the one that anointed Saul, King Saul, the first king of Israel, and then anointed David. You know, I mean, Saul went and did great things for God, but it wasn't, he, he wasn't born that way. His mom instilled that in him. And let's look there in 1 uh, Samuel verse 26. And it says, And she said, O my Lord, as thou... As thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worship the Lord there. And then turn over to chapter 2. So the first thing is Hannah teaches us to be in the spiritual battle. She realizes there's a spiritual battle for the souls of men and women. And she's willing to lend her son to the Lord for ministry to fight this battle. And it's funny, uh, well, it's not funny, it's interesting when we read this prayer here in, ch in chapter 2, it almost sounds like David, a, a prayer that David would have prayed in Psalms. And then David came after, you know, it was Saul, then David. But Hannah had that same spirit, that same attitude. And let's look at there, it says in uh, verse 1, it says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth. In the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There's none holy as the Lord. There's none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proud. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The, bo the bows of the mighty men are broken, and then they stumble, are girded with strength. That they, were, uh, they that were full have hired out themselves for bread. And they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she hath many children, is wax feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among the princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces, out of the heavens shall the, he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. This is Hannah's prayer before she leaves her son to the ministry of Christ. You know, first of all, today most people would judge Hannah for leaving her child into the ministry of Christ. What a bad mother. But she didn't leave him immediately. I mean, she weaned him off. He already had spent time with his mother, and she already had laid that spirit in him. And then this is the prayer that she prayed. It's a spiritual battle prayer. 
She says in, uh, I love that, that uh, right there in verse, uh, in verse 1, where she says, My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. She's, she's calling out the enemies. Now, she's, now she feels empowered because God came through and gave her a gift, which was her son. You know, I mean, she prayed to be, that he would open up her womb, and her gift back was that she lent her son to the ministry of Christ. And if you read all of Samuel, I mean, Samuel was a great prophet of the Lord. And he did some pretty amazing things. I mean, I wish we had time to go into it, but it just stands out. It's a testament to living a godly, motherly life. You know, you get your children ready for the spiritual battle more than the battles of life. There's a spiritual battle, the Bible says. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Go there. To, I mean, don't go there. Go to Luke 1. But uh, I'll just read for you real quick in this point. Psalm 18, verse 2 says, the Lord is my rock. And my fortress and my deliverer. See, Hannah understood what David would understand later. He says, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And let me make a point here. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it tells us who that rock is. It says, and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. See, we have the parable of someone who built their house on sand and someone who built their house on the rock. See, my prayer for mothers is that they build their, that they uh, raise their children on that rock, which is Jesus Christ. See, Hannah said, this is my rock, and our rock is not like their rock. My rock is God. It's Jesus Christ. See, they knew of Jesus Christ, just not by name in the Old Testament. Go to Luke 1. You know, we, then we see Mary the mother of Jesus, in the flesh, we see that there's a spiritual battle, but we also see that, you know, the wives are submissive to the will of the Lord. You know, a lot of times people throw that term around, wives need to be submissive to their husbands. But you know how a wife's submissive to her husband? If she's in obedience to the Lord. You know, the, po the point here is, it's important. And by the way, also the Bible tells us that husbands should love their wives as they love themselves. You know, I mean, I'm preaching to mothers right now, but... You know, husbands need to care for their, their wives and encourage them in their work as a, in the motherhood, in, work, in the work they're doing as mothers in motherhood. But I go there to Luke 1, and in verse 26 it says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a holy city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's na name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, Thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. See, today we have all kinds of, you know, the reason that there's a fight to keep Planned Parenthood is not only for the murder of babies, it's for the uh, promotion of going out there and being basically a bunch of whores, being in fornication, doing the things that the world wants you to do. Why? But if you want to find favor in the Lord, you're going to be a chaste virgin woman before you get married. The Bible says there in, uh, in uh, Luke 1, 31, it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She didn't know a man because she was being chaste, and she, that's why she found favor in the Lord. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and in the sixth month with her, who was, called, uh, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. The point here is she said, Whatever your word is, that's what we'll do. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the, the reason she was uh, submissive to thy word is because it was God's word. She was willing to obey God's command. You know, earlier today we were going over in Sunday school, we're talking about Esther, and Esther was so powerful in the Bible because she obeyed God over man. See, mothers should obey God 
over man, even over their husbands, if their husbands are asking them to do something that's going against God's word. Now, I'm preaching here and I'm making the assumption that you have a godly mother, you should have also a godly husband or a godly father, right? But uh, they're in a, turn over to 2 Timothy, and we're almost done here. But in 1 Timothy 5, 14, the Bible says, you're, in, you're going to 2 Timothy, but just so you can see, it says, this is the desire that God has for young women. It says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. You know, so I mean, what I'm preaching to you today is not my opinion, it's not what I think, it's, this is God's word. Now, have we all lived exactly like God's asked? You know, if I were to ask any mother, have you lived according to everything that God's asked? No. You know, we're sinners saved by grace, but the main thing is that when you're saved, if you really want to walk in righteousness, then your desire is to do God's will, and you'll do it in spirit and in truth. You're there in 2 Timothy, and then we're going to look at just another set of mothers and grandmothers. And um, I'm going to make sure I get this, this, uh, this right. It's Lois and Eunice. My wife was making fun of me because I kept saying Lewis for some reason. You know, sometimes you, learning two languages, being bilingual, you, you, you get a little tongue-tied. So she's like, please don't mess that up because I was going over it. And she's like, please don't say Lewis. And I said, well, if I say Lewis, I'll just say Lewis and Clark. And, uh, you know, she's not here, but... Last night, she made sure she corrected me, so it's Lois, like Lois and Lane, right? And Lois and, and Eunice, and which, what they, what they um, I, I don't have any water over here. I'm getting a little uh, dry. But what they taught was to be faithful, right? And this, is, this really stood out to me, and this is why I want to end with this, because I don't just want to preach to mothers so you be a good mother, but so that you leave a good legacy. You know, Lois and Eunice... They did such a good job that Timothy is one of the greats in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Paul considered him his spiritual son. You know, Paul saw something in him that he didn't see in others. You know, Paul said, look, I'm going to lay hands on you because there's something special about you. But why was it special? Let's look there. Go to first Tim I mean, 2 Timothy 1, verse 5. It says, when I called, when I called to remembrance the unfeigned, meaning the, the real deal, not the fake hypocritical faith, the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt, uh, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. And then pay attention to this. It says, Wherefore, I put in thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. You know, it wasn't, Timothy didn't just become this great preacher because Paul's laying hand on him. What did Paul say? He says, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that I stir up the gift of God. What did Lo, Lo, uh, Lewis, uh, there I messed up again, Lois and Eunice do? They led Timothy to salvation and they put that spirit of truth in him. You know, Paul didn't do anything but just ordain him, order him to go out into the world and preach the word. You know, this is where we find those verses, preach the word. We, we find the... the the qualifications of a bishop written in Timothy. We find, you know, how to lead a godly family, how wives and husbands should act and how children should act. We find all this in the books of Timothy. And what does Paul say? He says, Wherefore I put in thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift. See, if uh, Pastor Cobb laid hands on me a few years back when he ordained me to preach, but he just stirred up the gift that was already in me. You know, my mom raised me up, and I remember going to a Christian church when I was five. And then we went to the wrong church. But that, that seed was already planted at five, six, seven, eight years old. You know, the legacy is not for you as the mother. The legacy is for Christ. What are you doing? What kind of children are you raising up in this spiritual battle? Are we going to raise confused children that don't know right from wrong? That don't, you know, that they're just like every wind of doctrine makes sense to them? Or are we going to raise them to stand on truth? You know, I can think back, and I'll end with this. I remember back in like 2002, I got saved at 25. So in 2002, 2003, I was 22 or 23. I have two sodomite uncles. They're, uh, they're, you know, they are about as wicked as come. But I didn't know that then at the time. And my uncle, one of them, he runs a PR firm in Hollywood in, uh, for Latin, for Hispanics. He's worked with like Jennifer Lopez and some of these bigger names that you guys would probably know. And he called me, and he had just started his firm a few years before, and he called me at the age of 22 because I got a marketing degree. And he asked me to come up to Los Angeles and work with him 
and eventually he would leave me the business, that I would eventually own that business, that I would run it. And I remember you know, thinking that'd be really cool because I wanted to run it in, a, in a big business. And Hollywood was cooler back then to me than it is now. You know, now I just think they're a bunch of idiots. But back then, I actually didn't think like that. But I remember that one of the things my parents instilled in me, even though I wasn't saved, is that that lifestyle was not something that we took lightly to. And that that lifestyle was wicked and that it led down to a path of destruction and that it was not a good lifestyle. And I remember calling my uncle at 22, 23, and telling him, no, thank you. And I remember how offended he was. I could hear it over the phone. And, you know, I, I didn't have this vast wisdom. I didn't know all the things that I know now. But I knew the foundation that my parents had instilled in me at that time. And I'm so glad that I made that decision based on the things that they taught me because I'm standing here today preaching God's truth. You know, and I've, in the recent years, I've confirmed that my mom is now saved by grace. Pray for my dad. He's not. But there's a lot of things that have happened that I didn't see back then when I was 22, 23, making that decision. But it was stirred up in me because of what my mother did. And my grandmother, I remember my grandmother, my mom's mom was so sweet and nice and spiritual. I mean, she always gave me such good advice. You know, I hated being scolded by my grandmother because my parents would at least spank us. My grandmother always made you feel real bad, kindly. She just asked you real nice questions and talked to you real nice. And by the time you knew it, you were crying and you felt like you were the biggest jerk in the world. You know, they just had that compassion. You know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking uh, Timothy probably had a little bit of that with his grandmother and mother. And Paul saw that power in him, and he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting of my hands. It's already in him. See, your duty as a mother is to do that for your children, for your daughters and for your sons, to put that power in them of Jesus Christ. You know, the only way that we're going to battle this tide, that we're going to stem the tide, is to put the truth of Jesus Christ in, in, uh, in people. You know, I remember when I met, and I'll close out, I remember when I met Brian, and only because his parents are here a couple weeks ago, I didn't assume that he knew what salvation was, even though he was coming to church. I asked him. You know, we, come to, we, we serve here in a church where we want to know the truth. And we want to know not only the truth from God's Word, but we want to know the truth about you. We want to know where your soul is going. Is it going to hell, or is it going to heaven for all eternity? And I'm not going to sit there and argue with you any other point until I know where your salvation is, and if it's eternal and if it's secure. And so, you know, closing out, Hannah prepared for the spiritual battle. She prepared her children for the spiritual battle. Samuel was prepared and did great things for the Lord because of Hannah's prayers. And she didn't pray a woe is me prayer. She didn't get up there and say, oh, Lord, I'm going to leave you my son, and I'm never going to see him. No, she prayed a prayer of a fight. That was a battle prayer. Mary, Mary got ready to receive the Savior of the world by saying, whatever you're saying, thy word, that's what we're going to do. And then we see Lois and Eunice, their faith was unfeigned. They didn't go around pretending to be something that they weren't. They just served the Lord regardless of the consequences. And Timothy was one of the greats because of that. So in saying that, I just hope that that was a, you know, a message that helps you out. And I hope that it helped everybody out. But if you're a mother, a grandmother, soon to be a mother, remember, you have a huge responsibility. Don't let the world tell you that your biggest career, your biggest work, is worth nothing. There's nothing. I mean, my wife's 24-7. Migraine, no migraine, sick, not sick. I mean, I try to help, and those kids don't, after a while, they're like, mama, mama. You know, I'm like, hey, your mom's sick. She's tired. Mama, mama. She just has to find the strength to take care of them. And I'm not, my, my wife's not anything special. Every mother in here has done that. Every mother in here has spent sleepless nights caring for their children, right? Every mother in here has been thrown up on and pooped on and thrown tantrums and embarrassed. I mean, my wife's not anything special, but the special mothers are the ones that instill Jesus Christ in their life. And that's the message that I want to leave you with. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to preach here today. Thank you, for, uh, thank you Pastor Cobb, for letting me do this. And Lord, we just look forward to the baptism and, uh, and we look forward to the great works that will come from there, but we know that none of that would be possible if it wasn't for the mothers in our lives, the ones that instilled those uh, moments, those, those quiet moments when nobody watched, and they gave us those words of wisdom, that nurturing, that discipline that can only come from a godly mother. So uh, my prayer is that if, uh, if a mother is out there struggling with anything, that they know that as long as they have the foundation in you, 
and they put that foundation in their children, then they've done the will of God. Everything else is just a matter of work. I mean, we live in the flesh and in the spirit. It's a constant battle, and nobody conquers it completely until we get to heaven with you, Lord. So just give us that strength to reset and go out there and prepare for those spiritual battles to obey your word, Lord, and to have a, uh, a faith that is unfeigned. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.